Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be talking about support and how to make it fun and profitable. We're uh, going to just get going here. My name's Anne. I am the director of um, I'm the director of training and support at Chapter Three. My job in support is to really keep the queue calm, keep clients happy, and keep things fun. Sweet. I work with Anne at Chapter 3. I'm a support developer and I also help all the whole support dev team um, when they get stuck. Hey, and I'm Scott. I'm the Director of Customer Success at Pantheon. Uh, prior to that, I worked at uh, ProMap and Shell. Prior to that, I worked in managed services and IT. So I'm here to talk about service design and management. people currently work in support? Huge hand goes up. <laughs> hey, Reed. Um, how many people are looking to start a support department or are interested in working in support? Yay. And how many people are actually actively looking for support or help? Okay, good. Good to know who's in the audience. Um, so, like I said, my name's Dan. I work at Chapter 3. We're a full service agency. I work on the training and support side of things. And when a website comes to us in support, it's it's done, it's ready for production, it's ready for launch, but I find a website is never completely finished. Support is not about upgrading modules and just doing security patches. Support in a website is really, you know, maintaining and growing a, a living organism that needs continual love and attention. So when I think about support, and I'm talking about the people side of things, so when I'm talking about the people side of things, both from the client's perspective and the developer's perspective, I looked at it as in if we were treating it like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So today I'm going to compare the support on the client side and on the developer side to this level of hierarchy of needs. The first one is physical needs. So when a client calls me for support, it's not, it's very often that they're calling me with fires or issues. They're usually not very calm on that phone call and need immediate help. So when I'm looking at onboarding a new client, I'm first looking at what is their primary needs. Is something blocked of their primary business objective or their organizational objective, and how can we quickly overcome it? Michelle's going to talk about onboarding clients for success through an auditing process, and, um, and Scott's going to go on to talk about more service level agreements, but I find that regardless of, of process and structure, you really need to first figure out what is that burning need and how can we help it. Small wins mean big to those clients. When it comes to developers, they also have primary needs. Support can be intense. It can be fiery. We're working on production. Things move fast. So I find by creating a positive work environment with good food and good drinks is a great place to start when you're looking at those basic needs from both sides. The next one is about safety and security. This is a very interesting place of support because most people that come to me in support, or a large chunk of them, don't feel very safe and secure. They've maybe been in a past situation that has caused some current pain. Maybe you guys have experienced those intense communicators, the ones that, like, as soon as you jump online, they're all over you, or they're sending you five emails a day on the same thing. Or maybe they're really hyper-intense about budgets, and they want to have a budget. You know, they want to hit an X amount every single ticket before it's actionable. Well, support moves too quickly for some of that stuff. So really, when we're talking about making clients feel safe and secure in support, is to give them the tools they need and to give them the response times that they need to move to move things forward. For example, those intensive communicators, reply to their email, answer their chat. It doesn't mean you have to do the work right away, but if you acknowledge them that they're heard, and then you give them some structure and some expectations, and you follow through on those things, if you say you're going to do the work on Thursday, then make sure it gets done, all of a sudden you'll be able to work with those clients a little bit more quietly. Same with the hyper-budget intensive clients. If and Scott's going to talk about service level agreements, making sure they have some expectations around how much they're going to spend every month. That helps them a lot, especially if they've come from a place where maybe they got burned with big budgets or cost overruns. When it comes to developers, developers, we often, it, they're on the front line. We step out of the way as account managers and project managers to make sure that stuff gets done as quickly as possible. But we also want to make sure that the devs have someone to turn to. They have someone to ask questions to. 
And if you have a fiery client that maybe is really intense, they know that they can rely on their account services person to go and talk to that client and work through some of that pain to make it more enjoyable for all. As we go along and our clients are getting more comfortable working with us, there's now this sense of belonging. We find that when you have support routines and things are in a pattern of motion, that clients soon become very comfortable working with you. If you say you're going to work with them on Wednesdays, then they know they can block off time in their mornings to do QA on the tickets that are open. That really helps move things along, and they know there's consistency. Consistency is really important in support because things do go up and down. It can get kind of fiery on a very short basis. As for developers, developers also need calm within the chaos, and they also need a sense of collaboration. Um, in our team, we have a very active IRC channel or a Skype channel where they can post questions or challenges where they're stuck and we can all collaborate as a team. We also find a little bit of ridiculousness in that, <laughs> in that thread or in that queue really helps lighten the mood when there is fiery things that are going on. So when it goes on through the hi hierarchy of needs, we're now looking at the esteem needs. So this is often the client that's a little bit, has been working with you for maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months. It's often sometimes, you know, winning, having some of those small wins will make them great clients in the long run. When they're at this stage, these clients are typically great. Um, you've helped them, you know, white screen of death, you got on, you fixed things. All of a sudden, these clients that maybe were a little fiery and a little hoppy at first are now really comfortable working with you. They're giving great referrals. They're showing off the work that you've been doing in the queue. They're overall getting to be very happy, manageable people. And when it comes to developers, they're also really solving hard problems, they're collaborating, they're working together. And I find one of the most important things in client services is to recognize a job well done. Um, and it's not just within the support team itself, it's also right to the client. The client sometimes doesn't understand how challenging things can be in support, so if the, if the developer or the team has done great work, it's, it's really important to acknowledge them on a very public space. And of course, as at the top of the Maslow hierarchy of needs is actualization. So this is when the queue is calm and stress-free. And I find, you know, when you're working with people in support, it's really easy to get bogged down in the fiery nature of the tickets. In the end, we're not delivering babies. <laughs> we may be saving lives in other ways, but it's really important to keep things calm and stress-free and make it as safe and support and fun as possible. So now that I can be assured that clients' needs and my needs are in the cushioned, capable hands of Anne and Scott and all the other brave account managers, support managers that are out there. Um, now it's just me alone with the code, and I can judge it. And I think of uh, support, it's like um, finding yourself the supervisor of an apartment building. Um, you're the superintendent. You're responsible for fixing stuff when it's broken, figuring out you know, how to do repairs and roll out new um, appliances. Um, you didn't build the apartment building. You had nothing to do with the design. Suddenly it's yours. People are calling on you. You want to make their lives better. Um, and it, it, it's, if you can find yourself in one of those situations where you, you, you have the best of intentions, you think, oh, I'm going to go and upgrade all these appliances, and the lives are going to be better. We're going to fix this. And then all of a sudden the ceiling falls down, and you look at the ceiling, and there's this mold in the ceiling, and, um, and you're like, oh, we got to like figure out where this mold is coming from. The clients are like, no, 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 just like scrape it off and patch up the ceiling. And you're like, no, you don't understand. Like The whole building is going to come down. And so then you have to start finding a plan to move them out of the building. So it can get, uh, it can get hairy pretty quickly. So this was a, a pretty famous study that was done. Um, both in 1996 and then again in 2006 with just about the same results. So when, when managers, when IT managers were asked, hey, rate your projects, how would you, um, how would you rate the relative success of all your projects? This is what they said. And I'll never really see the failures, I'll never really see the successes, um, but 53% of IT managers says they have 53% of their projects are project challenge. So the, the whole point of an audit um, is about checking to finding ways um, to check exactly how that is project um, challenged. So doing an inspection of the building before you become the supervisor of it. So here are just a few things that I have noticed in my auditing um, of, of ways that projects could be project challenged um, as 
the conscious support. One of the ways is if they have a, um, a WYSIWYG theme. Uh, this is a theme. This is a theme um, that maybe all of their content types are just uh, titles and body fields. Um, and they have the full uh, WYSIWYG on. And they've got images and tables and um, in embedded videos um, all up in there, all just hanging out in the, the body field. Um, and the reason why this is a problem is because uh, Drupal really likes to manage content. And if content is just all stuck in the body field, it's not available for Drupal. It's not available um, to create video libraries and, and pull from the body field the videos. You can't the images, um, and it's not scalable because whatever the design, whatever the, the look of the um, of the site is, it lives in the content editor's head. They just have to know how it looks in their head, and every time they sit down and add a piece of content, they are designing it with the WYSIWYG. So really quick check. Um, of course, you're, you're doing this locally. You would never do this on a live environment, um, but you just turn off the WYSIWYG and see if the site falls apart. Uh, another way that I've seen that uh, sites could be project challenged uh, is if they have hide and seek PHP. So this is PHP that is hidden somewhere, uh, usually in like body fields of um, a node. Uh, it could also be they, they like to hide in uh, um, in the global fields of views or in blocks. And uh, this is a problem. What I'm talking about with in, uh, this is inline PHP. So they have their PHP on and they have some kind of script. So this particular um, script, um, it was in a node um, that it was in the body field of a node. It had PHP filtering on, and it calls a script which was in root um, that bootstrapped Drupal with like hard coded credentials. Um, and so it's providing significantly fun significant functionality um, just right inside of a body field. Why is it bad to put PHP um, inside? Uh, the database, well, it, it doesn't cache, for one, so I, I can't solve any per performance issues. It's really difficult to trace. If there's, if there's functionality going on on the website that is just like in the database, it's just just going through all of the possible places it could, it could be, which is a pain in support. That's how you end up with like 16 hours of work for something that was supposed to be really simple. It also doesn't export well. So the reason, you can figure out if you have a site um, that, that has uh, hide and seek PHP by just turning off the PHP filtering. And, and of course, developers would never put PH, inline PHP in their sites. That just doesn't happen anymore with Drupal, right? Ever. And then there's your secret mission modules. The secret mission modules, they, um, they have a function. They have to get it done, but they can't tell you what it is. Um, it's super secret. Um, the developers just made it really difficult for you to figure out what was happening. Um, this particular module starts with an apology to the um, person who's looking at it, <laughs> that they're not entirely sure what it does, but it does it. So this is a problem. Uh, I was just having a conversation um, now with Megan that one of the biggest challenges I have at support when there's custom modules like this is no matter how much documentation that I provide um, in an audit, uh, no matter how clear I could be about what's going on here with how this site works, if it doesn't follow best practices, if, if there isn't a clear Drupal structure to this, this is completely customized. This might as well be a proprietary system. And no matter how much I look at it, no matter how much I write about it, if I created a wiki for it, there's just a, it just lives inside my mind how this particular site works. And I'm attached to it in a way that I don't want to be. So it, it, this particular um, problem, custom modules or a custom structure that just so deviates from what Drupal does is a major problem because it means you're stuck with it. Um, so there's really no good way, there's no quick way to do this. Um, there's a lot of scripts that are out there. Um, I'd be really interested to hear from other developers how they do this. Um, I have some scripts that check for complexity for copy and paste for Drupal standards that I can run inside the Vagrant box and do a port. Um, there's a lot of helper modules that, um, that can help with this. Uh, but really, you, you have to just open up the modules, um, the, the custom modules. And I'd also like to hear how you figure out if they're custom modules or uh, maybe contrib. Um, I have some tricks, but you know, kind of hacks. Um, so you just have to like open up the custom module and see what it does. Finally, there's the code base porter. Um, this is a, 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 a programmer who has refused all um, attempts to um, organize. Uh, this, uh, these are not your container store um, visitors. They just put modules wherever they want, I guess. And in the in the core module.
schedules and routes um, in their own like directory of the Russian doll thing and defaults and default files. Um, it, this is a problem because they've never read any documentation ever. They've never ever read anything about Drupal. So um, you could just see what modules are enabled on their site and then like go find them and just see if you can figure out where they are. So I know you're wondering, do we dream of electric support developers? And in fact, we do. We, we dream often about our, our job just becoming um, robotic. Um, and mostly the dream is that every that an audit happened at every single build. Every time there was a git commit, there was a electric support developer who was running this audit because they're inline PHP. Are your custom modules making sense? Um, are you putting things in the right place? Uh, in an ideal world, there would be an electric support developer at every single stage. And there are tools to help with this. I know there will be a ton of um, sessions today talking about um, ways to do this. So I won't, go, I won't go into that, but that is, that is the dream. In the meantime, uh, I would like to at least um, stop this, these balls of sites that come rolling in, into support, and they're just a patched up Drupal, WordPress, PHP scripts, poison, sadness, um, just rolling up and, and just here, audit this, figure out what that is. And one of the ways that we can do this um, is if we just, if clients just look for shops um, or contractors that have a view to support mentality, which is why I think if you don't have support, um, if you're, you're not offering support, you should. Um, because it changes the way you think about things. If you have support developers whining all the time about, I can't read your shit, then you can have developers who are facing that, looking at my face all day long. Um, and then finally, what, what could really make support better is just putting configuration in code, putting all configuration in code. There's so many modules out there right now, features, the configuration module, role explorer, all, all these things. There's really no excuse anymore if you're not putting your configuration in code, you're not doing things professionally. And finally, just test your shit. I don't care how it is, you know, simple tests is, can be hairy, so fine, just a PHP script, a bash script, whatever you gotta do, just test it. Um, so Linus Turvelt said uh, in, the, in the 80s when, um, when there was like a lot of navel gazing in the developer community and why can't we build stuff that are like cathedrals? Why can't we build things that last for centuries? Um, but this became the, the question, and Linus came around and he's like, well, we'll just have everybody look at it. I mean, that seemed like chaos to so many people, but he said, if given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. If enough people are looking at it, enough people are figuring it out, um, then there's no bug that we can't handle, which is the beauty of open source. So not only should we all be looking at our own stuff, we need to look and, and test our Drupal core, uh, Drupal contributor modules, uh, if there's enough eyeballs on it, Drupal will be completely bug free. So I think about my job as a Drupal support developer, um, similar to being a doctor in a Drupal hospital. So sites or patients come to me, and some of them are actually really healthy, and they just kind of want to check up, and they want to, you know, do their uh, annual maintenance, maybe take some vitamins, and things are pretty easy going. Um, other times, sites come into the hospital and they need really serious medical attention. Something is definitely wrong. Um, they need a lot of help in order to get back to being healthy again. So being a Drupal doctor, um, I've kind of come to what I would think any good doctor would agree with, which is that prevention is better than cure. It's way easier to try to prevent issues from happening than having to solve them later on especially when, you know, solving them might mean, you know, the site is down or some kind of major functionality is not there and you're working on a production server and things are very stressful. So as far as like how I think about doing development in the support environment, I find that it's really useful to kind of take a step back and look at Drupal holistically. So I think about Drupal as being an ecosystem. So it's an open source project, there's thousands of contributors. The state of core and the state of contrib is constantly evolving. So of course we need to be up to date about that and we need to kind of, you know, have a sense of the pulse of the community, what the best practices are, and just kind of stay up to date with what's cool. But beyond that, you know, when you're working on a support site, uh, the ecosystem is, is even broader than just the Drupal code base itself. It's really a dynamic thing that includes, you know, tons
timelines, that includes budgets, um, includes you know your state of your servers and how easy it is to deploy, um, and of course also your team's strengths and abilities. So there's a big difference between working on a support site that is at the end of its life and it's just trying you know you're just kind of trying to band-aid it and you know make it make its end of life as comfortable as possible before you know a rebuild happens. Um, versus a site that's just out of the gate, you know, it's, it's brand new and it's flashy. Um, how you go about making technical decisions um, in different circumstances really varies based on this like, holistic idea of the environment you're working in. So it's really important to kind of deal with what you have um, and also what you don't have. And, and in the same way, when you're building a site um, from the get-go, you don't want to, like, stretch it and have, like, the functionality be, like, be beyond what the budget and the um, ecosystem can hold. You want to keep your ecosystem really healthy and um, kind of manage all of those moving pieces. So working with, uh, you know, maintaining Drupal sites has been super interesting for me. Um, I've actually get to see firsthand, you know, how Drupal sites that folks, all sorts of different folks build, hold up over the long term. So I get to actually watch, you know, like where the fault lines are, what the issues are, um, both at kind of at all stages of life after a Drupal site has gone live. And so just in the same way when you're building a Drupal site, you can make like major architectural mistakes that compromise the site over the course of its life. I also have found that as a developer in support, it's possible to either continue on or like perpetuate those existing issues or diseases, or even initiate some of your own. Um, so I want to share with you guys and Drupal diseases that I find that are really common in support and just kind of give you some tips about how to go about avoiding them. So first of all, Drupal is a, uh, is a system that's built on with this idea of overriding, right? That's the best practice. Um, you, you use a hook, you use a preprocess function, you're overriding a template, um, and that is generally how we go about things to keep it uh, kind of clean and sane. But when you're working on a site that you didn't build, sometimes it's really easy to accidentally override your overrides, or even not accidentally, just kind of being lazy. Um, so it's, and learning a site takes time. It's not something that can just happen immediately. Like Michelle mentioned, you know, a lot of it is just kind of learning how it works. So it's really important to just make sure you're looking for existing parts of the site where, where functionality is happening, and then go to that place, you know, to make changes to that. Um, along with that is also, you know, the best Drupal sites when they're architected are modular, um, and so they're using code, they're writing code and using, um, thinking about how to build functionality that is kind of like as separate as it can be. Um, so you, a, a good example of something that's not modular is like a CSS selector that's like block block 8, um, or a template file that's like node q10, because um, those things are really specific to that Drupal site and can't ever be reused. So it's important, you know, sometimes that's the easy thing to do, is to kind of get out of the idea of making it modular and just write a whole bunch of one-offs. But in support, we still have to, like, maintain things over the long term. We should still be kind of holding ourselves up to the standard um, of keeping things as reusable as possible. Another common thing I see is, um, you know, you want to solve clients' problems. There's this whole kind of feeling of doing customer service and really wanting to help people. But... And, and Drupal is amazing. The, the ecosystem is huge. You can go and find a module that will pull off what you need. And sometimes it's, you know, really easy to just kind of like be like, yeah, let's throw this extra module. We got this library. We can do it quick. Um, but, you know, all of that comes at a cost. Anything you add to a site is additional weight. It's like you're going on a trip and, like, the heavier your bags, the, like, harder it's going to be over the long term. So you want to keep things really light and lean. And so if you can use an existing tool on your site rather than having to add something new, that's going to be the preferred way to kind of keep it healthy. Um, another kind of way the same mistake gets made is when a client comes to you with a request and they think they know the answer of what they want, but what they actually are asking for, um, although they might not know it, is some training. Right, so they come to you with this like crazy feature that they have to have, and you're like, well, you could actually already do that. Here's how. Um, and so, you know, providing some training rather than just jumping to solve people's problems through code, um, you know, allows people to come to use their site um, and, and um, less you have to maintain, and it's, you know, better for everybody if everyone's empowered. Um, using Drupal as Dreamweaver is something that Michelle covered, um, but I oftentimes see this disease pop up when, you know, a client
client maybe didn't have a Drupal developer they could call for a while, and so they were kind of trying to get by as best as possible, and so they start doing stuff just like putting everything in the WYSIWYG. You know, they, they can't add their own JavaScript library into the code base because they don't know Git, so they just kind of dump it in there. They don't know how to add CSS, so they put it in like a, in the panel. Um, and that kind of stuff just um, becomes really difficult to maintain. So again, working with your um, clients and helping them understand what they can do and what they sh um, shouldn't do is, is important. So features is obviously a really powerful module that allows you to deploy things um, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to encode. But sometimes, you know, you have to be really thoughtful when you're doing that. Um, it's not necessarily like the easiest module to work with over the long term. And when you're using features without any kind of plan or workflow, things can just get really crazy and hard to deal with. So if the, you know, ideally the site was like featureized in the beginning with the idea of support in mind, and you can just kind of continue to move along with that process. But if you're introducing features at, at later on, make sure you have a really solid plan about how that's going to work and your whole team understands, okay, um, this is how we're going to deploy using that module. So I think if you're patching a uh, Drupal core or contrib and you don't tell anyone, you're a bad person. Um, I can tell you, like, it's been numerous times where I sit down, you know, and I'm just like, I don't understand why this isn't working the way it is, only to find that, like, someone that I thought would never have done it actually hacked a contrib, contrib module. And sometimes you're like, oh, it's just one little thing, or, you know, there's also folks who just don't know better and go crazy. Um, but, you know, if you're going to patch, do it, to, do it responsibly. Um, you can use um, something like Thresh Make, or, you know, you can just have a patches um, directory, like in Sites All, where you list, you know, not only every patch and what module it's for, um, but also like a link back to where it is on Drupal.org, um, plus a little bit of reasoning about why that's important. And that makes it so much easier later on when you need to like update the module, so you can just read that document and be like, oh, okay, this patch has been rolled in to the latest release, I'm good to go, I can remove the patch altogether. So along with that, you know, not patching and not sharing, uh, it's important as a support developer to leave a trail. Um, you're, you're likely not going to be the only person working on the site, and so we need to you know, keep each other in the loop. If someone needs to jump in and work on something you've been working on, they should be able to pick up where you left off. So to me, that means, you know, good commit messages. Um, that means really good comments and code. Um, that means, you know, leaving notes and tickets. Um, and we use a system of, like, even having private um, notes on a ticket that aren't shared with the client, but just kind of fill in, like, developer notes, you know, stuff that I've thought about or worked through, things I tried, just so that we're all, you know, have that transparency and are on the same page. Um, a really uh, frustrating Drupal disease is um, when, you know, you're kind of working with, like, a, it feels like Jenga, you know, and you, you go and you're like, okay, I'm just going to do, you know, turn off this one thing, and you, like, pull the block out and the whole thing falls over. You're just like, what? Why? It's not related. How did that happen? Like, that should never have happened. Um, and so the idea of, like, high coupling is when things are overlapped more than they should be. It's like you go to turn, you know, you go and run cron, and accidentally, like, a thousand emails get sent down, and you're just like, I don't, I don't really get it. Um, so it's, it's important to, you know, kind of try to keep things as, like, separate as possible. You should be able to turn a feature off and not have the site break. And so you want to kind of put stuff where it belongs, you know, JavaScript goes with JavaScript, template files are just, you know, more or less HTML and a little PHP, you know, your custom modules, break them up in a smart way, and have everything be kind of be clean and simple. Um, and the last Drupal disease, um, although I could probably go on forever, um, is ignoring um, api.drupal.org. So Drupal is an API, and that's really one way to think about it, and there's a lot of functions and um, information in the documentation that allow you to do powerful stuff that's been reviewed and tested by the community, and it's, it's you know, probably going to work pretty well. I see a lot of people who don't necessarily know Drupal super well coming in and just writing their own custom functions, which is frustrating because then it's custom code you have to maintain. You don't know if it's going to work with, you know, new modules that you want to add on, and it just makes the whole system uh, more difficult to work with. So you are inevitably going to want to make changes, new features, and do work on the site. Maybe there's some big issue you're trying to clean up. Um, and the philosophy I like to take when doing development is try to avoid, try to try to do non-invasive procedures. So thinking like a doctor, like what is the most, like how can I get in and get out as fast as possible? You know, you don't want to have like a 24-hour surgery if you can kind of like do it quick. 
Um, and part of that is understanding the philosophy of the original architecture. So Drupal sites can be built you know, so many different ways. There's so many ways that Drupal's used. So understanding what were those fundamental decisions in the beginning that um, how the site is constructed and then following along with that. So for example, you know, someone comes, the client comes to you and they're like, we want a custom front page. And you're like, cool, no problem. I know panels can pull that off in five seconds. Um, and you just slap panels onto the site and you're like, it's done. But could you like check to see if panels was already in use? You know, um, what, what else is going on as far as architecture? So in some ways it's like, it's better to just do what's already there than it is to like introduce your idea of what's best. Um, or your idea of what um, is, you know, easiest for you to do. So that really means like, you know, playing to your strengths and understanding the clients, the clients' real needs, what their real business needs are, um, and being able to recommend things that fit with their existing site. You know, sometimes they'll come to you and kind of like reaching for the moon, and you're like, well, your site was not architected to be able to do that, and you're like, it's just not possible in the constraints that are here. And so, you know, rather than stretching it to try to match them, you know, try to figure out a way that works with the existing site. And I also think it's important to have, like, a system for escalation. So you don't want necessarily want, like, a themer trying to solve, like, a back-end problem with a theming strategy. And you might not want, like, a back-end person trying to solve a theming problem with a back-end solution. So having, like, team collaboration, being able to pass off tickets and kind of ask for help um, just in general, creates uh, better, better code to work with. So support, like development, is kind of a constant stream of making technical decision, um, technical decisions, and it's com it's the added complexity is that you have to make these technical decisions on lots of different systems. So it's not just like you're working on one site um, and kind of working on it for months. You have to jump between client to client, you know, even within this, the course of a single day. Um, so this, this technical decision making um, becomes kind of tricky because sometimes, you know, you, there's a way you want to do it, which might take 20 hours, and then there's the quick and dirty way, which might take like two hours, and you have to make this decision like, oh, what do I do? Um, so I think what the idea of what's sustainable is actually like a pretty big spectrum, and both answers can be right and wrong sometimes. So what I try to, the way I try to think about this and what I try to avoid the most is technical debt. And technical debt for me is, you know, when you say, okay, we'll just do it the quick way now, and later on we'll fix it, no problem. What you're actually doing is just like prolonging having to um, deal with a problem, and you're racking up interest all the way along. And so, you know, try to come up with like a, a sustainable solution in the beginning. Um, even, you know, if it is a quick and dirty one, um, you know, at least kind of like commit to that and don't prolong the process to later. So another large part of being a support developer is your response time. And I think that the most of the response time is actually trying to figure out what's broken. Um, usually once you know what's broken, it's, it's much easier to find a solution. So the first question I ask myself is, okay, how can I replicate this error? Because if you can't replicate the problem, how will you know if it's fixed, right? So once you can reproduce it, then you can start to kind of dig into it and figure out how to solve it. Um, I'm, I'm really quick to um, look in the source code for whatever information I can, kind of like figure out, okay, like what players are involved here, you know, what views should I be looking at, you know, what panel panes. Um, the source code can actually help you reverse engineer really quickly. Um, and also, I'm really quick to Google, because um, ideally the solution already exists. I mean, in an ideal world, you could just like go to drupal.org and Google it and find the patch that fixes a problem, like that's ideal. Um, of course, you know, we don't have the luxury of that always being the case. So sometimes, you know, once we do catch down um, an issue, we have to come up with a solution. We have to propose a solution. And then there has to be a period of cost-benefit analysis and really analyzing, you know, what is, the, uh, what is the benefit of doing it this way. And, you know, you can even kind of, like, uh, interface with the client a little bit and get some feedback um, before, you know, finally implementing and deploying. So deployment is something we do all the time as support developers. It's just something you kind of learn to live with because it just happens every day. Um, and it can be kind of scary when you're first getting into it, but it, my whole, what keeps, what keeps it really good for me is when it's just simple and it's really sane and you can just have a really awesome structured environment with everything you need to be a good developer. 
So if a client does come to us who doesn't have that kind of like professional workflow set up, we try to get them there. Um, and really, ideally, your whole team can deploy. It's not something that like only a sysadmin who like understands the server can do. Um, and so, you know, all the developer tools like Drush and Drush aliases and just SSH config, being able to um, work on the site uh, safely and comfortably uh, really, really kind of keeps the stress level down and makes support really fun. Because it is fun to deal with machine production every day. So my main takeaway is just keep it simple. And if it can be simple, then make it very, very clear. You owe it to yourself and to uh, any other people working on the site to let let them know what's going on. All right, so if you've gotten the theme here, we've all sort of picked uh, what we think of as, you know, what we think of when we think of support and the metaphor for support. So, um, you know, we have the doctor and the apartment superintendent and the psychotherapist. And so what I thought of was um, if, if I opened a restaurant, I uh, decided that I was going to completely rethink how restaurants work, and I was going to put it right next to a Whole Foods, and I was just not going to have a menu whatsoever. So if someone came in and they wanted lasagna, I'd figure out how to cook them lasagna. And then if someone else wanted birthday cake, I'd make them a birthday cake. And I built this whole restaurant that was based on no menu, just whatever people wanted. And then so, you know, this, you know, I've seen kitchen nightmares. I know nothing bad can happen with a, with an idea like that. So. I, uh, I think about it, and I uh, test it out, and then I decide finally, okay, I'm ready to go. I open it, and the doors open, and people flush, you know, people pour in, and all my sections are full, and um, I walk up to the first table, and they say, um, I like this place so much that I'm going to eat here for every meal for a year, and uh, here's my allergy list. And that's kind of how I think of, like, how support can be, and... Um, and how to prevent that. And so the reason that I thought of that was because, like, long before uh, I got into IT, I was a musician, so I, uh, I got to be a really good waiter and um, a really good bartender. And, uh, well, not so much a good bartender, but a good waiter. And um, so the, a lot of what I've learned about IT and development and Drupal came later, but a lot of what I, know, what I learned about management and working with people and working with customers came from waiting tables and working with managers who were really good at that. And so I'm going to share a couple platitudes about that and then kind of dive into the, you know, the, the how to run a, a great Drupal support um, uh, department. So uh, the first thing that I was taught is to run the table, don't let it run you. And that, that just means like when you walk up to a table and you're a waiter and you say, uh, well, um, what do you guys want to do? They'll say, okay, well, get me a shot, and then you run back, and they'll say, well, get me four waters, and then it's already out of control from the beginning, and um, so this is like, there's there's two keys to success in support, like it's the people, and then it's the processes, so the people part of it, um, uh, on your side, means uh, training your people, it means giving them the, uh, to use like really uh, sort of vague, fluffy words, like empower them to solve the client's problems and uh, sort of explain what that means in, in really clear detail because, um, you know, support, or, support and projects can be very different. Like, support is long-term. It's a short life cycle of finding a solution and implementing it. And so having, like, a, uh, a, a very sort of bureaucratic um, sort of life cycle for that doesn't really work very well. So being able to have something where you, where you know, you know, your developer knows the expectations of, of how to solve the problem and how to implement that is really important. Um, the next thing is the five Ps, and that's uh, proper planning prevents. Um, you can input piss poor, I've heard sometimes. I don't say that, but prevents poor performance. And, like, the, the military version of that is we don't, uh, rise to the occasion, we sink to the level our, of our preparation. And so, like, delivering support, especially for, for now, like, in Pantheon, um, like, workflows are really important, and that's sort of the processes part of it, you know, being able to escalate an issue, um, sort of, like, like, these developers are great, and they've just sort of given you, like, how, how they would like to be managed, you know, what they talked about earlier. So, um, implementing that and not 
throwing something at them and saying, fix this, I don't know how you're going to do it, is really important to the success of your department because uh, no one's going to stick around, you know, if, if they sort of feel like they're under the gun and they don't, you know, they're not really, they don't have the knowledge to fix it or um, they can't and don't know where to go. So, um, you know, we work a lot on escalation. Uh, we work a lot on how to handle uh, emergency issues. We work a lot how to handle, like, platform issues versus uh, site-specific issues. And especially if you're doing hosting, like, that's a really important thing to, to be able to manage. Um, so then uh, one of the most important things, uh, sort of drilling down a little bit, is when you are talking to a client, actually understanding what they want. Um, like the three R's that I learned with waiting tables were read it, write it, and repeat it. So you actually read over the menu over their shoulder at what they're pointing at, and then you write it down so it's written, and then you repeat it back. So there's complete clarity about what you're going to place the order for. And I think like the, the corollary to that was when I was bartending. Um, if you, if you want to order the drink, you actually have to be able to say the drink. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, I, I, knowing when to cut people off was kind of an important thing. And, like, if they couldn't actually verbalize what they wanted to order, that was usually, like, a warning sign that they were, maybe they had too much. Um, I think that um, when, when, you, when you also sort of try and um, talk about support in the same aspects, uh, clients may... Just because they're not sure what they want, that may not stop them from asking for it. And being able to go back and forth until you're completely clear about what they're actually asking for. Um, you know, it's kind of like projects. You know, a lot of projects aren't really lost in execution. They're lost in the discovery part of it where you didn't do enough uh, sort of uh, due diligence. So... So... Most people here who work on projects are pretty familiar with the project life cycle. Um, I think when, if you're looking to start support or looking to build your support services, um, there are frameworks for this stuff. And ITIL was one that I used in managed services before I got into sort of Drupal and managing development support teams and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, ITIL and uh, IT service management um, is another sort of tool that gives you a really good framework for building support um, and building services. So, like, uh, you know, the strategy part of it is sort of figuring out what there's there's market demand for and if you have the need and if you have the skills and the abilities to fill that. And I think that's really important with a support. Like, the, the, th the way that you fail for me as a on a support team is by trying to deliver everything that people want and trying to do all things for all people. And I think um, one of the models that I used previously was uh, sort of... Uh, using uh, downstream providers for services. And I think that model applies really well to Drupal if you can apply it right. I think there's, you know, there are, are shops that I know of that are great, like City CRM and experts, and people that are great panels people, and people that are really good with features, and that sort of thing. And I think that it's very possible to sort of have a framework where you can rely on other people um, to kind of leverage uh, support when you need it, if you can, you know, if you can sort of set the terms correctly. So, sort of designing, the, you know, coming up with the strategy and then building that, figuring out how you're going to handle the workflow is kind of the next step, the design step. How are you going to escalate? How are you going to make this actually work? And sort of testing for, you know, edge cases, which are going to be the ones that are going to going to uh, to stick with you. Um, so you designed it, then you actually put it into place and you practice it and you monitor it and you actually see how it's going. Like one of my favorite things about my job is sort of improving the process. Like the uh, at Pantheon. Enterprise clients would come on, and um, we would sort of uh, watch them get onto the platform and maybe be not familiar with Nginx and or Apache or something like that. And we'd sort of feel their struggle, and they'd open tickets like they normally would. Um, but we could tell that they weren't happy, and one of the first things we did was put in uh, an onboarding process. And like our onboarding process now, it's you know as imperfect as it is, uh, it gets better and better. And the results are lower support tickets over the long haul. And, you know, like not all clients want to do that, um, but 
I know it's better. Like everything that was covered in these last, you know, the 10 diseases and that sort of thing, they weren't made up. They exist because people come to New Megan with these problems. And so I have this laundry list of the top things that, that developers run into when they're coming onto the platform and the top list of things right before going live. So whether people want to or not, I set up a call with them where I just read the list. And, you know, I don't know if they're asleep on the other end of the phone or if they're, you know, reading a book or whatever, but I know that I'm, I'm setting expectations and I'm letting them know that later on down the road if they have these problems, I can say, well, we did try and discuss this at onboarding. And most of the time it doesn't come to that. Like most of the time they see the value of it and it puts more like in the whole sort of pigs versus chicken thing, it puts more sort of pigs into the, into the mix here and there's more stakeholders involved, and especially getting everybody involved, the stakeholders involved in the entire process of transitioning to support is really important. Um, and then, so just a couple things about the tools. Uh, you know, like I had mentioned, uh, support uh, really is its own workflow. It's not like a, like a traditional project management. Uh, and I think being able to have the process and have it down so cold that even if you're not around, if the support manager is not around, knowing that the support developer knows what to do when things get hairy or knows who to turn to when things get difficult is really important. Um, like as far as tools, one of the, you know, one of the best tools that, you know, the tools are sort of custom to what you support you offer. But for, for me, like when I worked in managed services, you know, we were doing like IT support for servers and that sort of thing, kind of typical Cisco, Microsoft products, you know, you didn't know, you could basically make a living just supporting those two products. And so that's what we did, and we could have a small media businesses and do that. And so our tool was really good at managing all the different configurations of block hours that we had with people with, um, you know, managed services agreements that sort of, you know, the things on a monthly recurring flat fee and, um, and the being able to calculate billable versus non-billable hours. And there's, not like, that was a pretty heavy application. It was like an old .NET thing. Um, but there are, you know, better applications out there. More and more are coming out that sort of have that built in there. Like the one that, um, you know, because we did a lot of block hours, we used this one called Packet Trap at, at the dev shop that I was at. And that, you know, takes a lot of time out of the project manager or support manager's hands for calculating how many block hours are being used and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, now we use, like, because, uh, like at Pantheon, we, we are answering tickets, but we're also doing onboarding. We're doing some training stuff, that sort of thing. Uh, we use uh, Desk because it's really flexible. It has a lot of uh, inputs and outputs to connect to different applications. And we use Do.com, which has been a lifesaver for me for these sort of rote uh, onboarding processes that we do over and over. And, uh, you know, it's just a real lightweight project management tool. There's a million of them, but um, I definitely recommend something other than Google Docs. And so, uh, like contract design, like I sort of just mentioned, uh, I think that uh, the, the amount of risk that uh, you sort of, your gut check tells you that a project is, kind of determines how you should shape your contract. I, I am a firm believer in making contracts easy for a support developer to, to support um, and understand. And, uh, you know, the more sort of uh, uh, labyrinthine you make it, the harder it is to carry out and the more time is wasted sort of managing the contract and not managing the clients. So I think uh, simple contracts that are sort of based on either block hours, monthly recurring, and block hours are sort of the highest risk thing. If a guy comes to you and says, I'm a PHP developer and I, I'm not that good and I have to finish this project, can you help? Like, that's a risky project. So you, you do not promise to do it for a fixed fee. I mean, obviously, you know, what a fixed bid for something like that might be kind of nuts unless you sort of know what the problem is. But even then, there's still risk about it. But like the, the less amount of risk, I think the goal is like the more times you do things and the more you specialize, especially if you're the city CRM expert, you probably have a better chance of knowing what the problem is when someone brings in a city CRM problem and there's less risk and you're more able to, to sell that as sort of a monthly recurring thing rather than a, um, you know, rather than a block hour agreement. And so finally, um, like the main point that I wanted to talk, talk about is that uh, like burnout exists, like it's, it's really like these guys need to have fun, um, you know, no one is in support, um, you know, people that are in support are special people, like they're customer facing 
and they have the technical chops. So I think um, you know, with us, we are very. I am very aware of how much time developers spend just churning out tickets, and um, I really sort of stress being able to uh, spend time on other things and uh, have their own sort of Google time or whatever to work on different projects. Um, and also, like I mentioned earlier, empowering the team, like letting them, letting them have say over what kind of work they're going to do, even if that means maybe saying no to a project or two. Um, I think uh, you know it is it is a team effort and it's really important. Um, so for whatever time we have left, that's sort of our spiel. Um, you know, we had some kind of ideas about different questions that we had, but uh, you know, it's we're open to to questions now. And, and thanks a lot. situation in Oklahoma yesterday. You guys might have heard of it. Um, what we're trying to do right now is pull together a Coders Lounge tonight, uh, starting at 7.30 at the uh, Doubletree Hotel's Coders Lounge. And we have a very specific need. We have a very specific goal. What we'd like to do is effectively build a website that will help us coordinate transportation needs and housing needs. And so we basically have four pushes. We need people that can code for the housing. We need people who can code for the transportation. We need people who can help promote for the housing portal, getting people to the housing portal to use it, and also for the uh, for the transportation portal. So okay. the 7:30 tonight, Coders Lounge at the DoubleTree Hotel. Uh, there's Bitly Bitly uh, slash Drupal for Oklahoma. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Yeah. A little bit bad going after that. a specific question. I think we have a small enough team than you guys, so we don't really have that chain of command. You can pass things over now. But my question is around, um, you know, you're a nice person, you want to help people, but what about those clients who are out of support but still keep asking you questions, and how do you handle them? them user acceptance, like bugs, or bugs happen, like, um, I think that's important, like something that needs to be addressed in discovery, is my opinion, and then uh, after user acceptance, there, you know, it's a, such a common thing that something turns up, but I think that, uh, you know, you have to draw the line, your, your business to make a profit, and, and I think that needs to be explained very early on to set expectations of how things are going to work, and, um, you know, I, I don't think that necessarily every billable hour needs to be billed, like there's a difference between actual and billable, but I think you uh, you set up a bad, uh, you know, a bad trend if, if you keep doing work for free long after the project's launched. The staff for your SLA is pretty important. Um, you know, if you're going to deliver two-hour turnaround time or something like that, you have to make sure that there's someone who's willing to, to have the pager uh, around that and then still also be able to handle I think there's there's a lot in analytics, like there's probably trends whether you know it or not, and we, we I use those models a lot to predict capacity um, and, you know, based on just the amount of tickets, the 
of typical sort of budget planning, like how many, you know, sales protections means how many tickets. Each ticket takes X amount of hours. You can come up with a rough model like that, and that's kind of what we use. Um, I use uh, just a, a simple linear progression. Like I, I, I just sort of looked at our past history that I export at a desk and um, build it off of that. And it's it's pretty close. I mean, there's there's a relatively high error, but it. it um, you know, it's sort of also based on being able to have a pretty accurate amount of response time, which we sort of guess at because we don't track time, um, just because nobody likes time check. Nobody likes entering time and being the ones that get it. But yeah, we we get kind of close, and um, we we go from there. Well, I, I think we're out of time. We're more than happy to answer more questions or talk about support. I know a lot.